kind of dumb. Uh. So we're missing one. We'll figure out who that is in a moment. Welcome to Bio 276, the class that's going extinct. So what you'll find is on Canvas, hopefully you can see all this. I'll always have the notes, and I'll usually put handouts and all that stuff there for you. But I also will always make, whether you choose to use them or not, that's that's on you, unless you hear those flat out, no! Because I can talk a lot, and there is a lot to this class, sometimes it helps to have some type of organizer so that you're somewhat oriented. Mm -hmm. So I make like a... If you can do what's on this, or take notes for what's on here, you should be okay. Because otherwise it's going to be, there's so much stuff, what's, what are we doing, what are we doing? And sometimes it's just easier to get it, like, hey, let me tell you what's important. If you fill it out, that's the important part. If it doesn't apply to that, it's just fluff. And eh, whatever's to the fluff. Also... I'm someone who, I don't like PowerPoints that have nothing but writing. It has all the text that you need to know, because to me, I just, then I don't need to be here. I should just say, here, read it, then I'll just test you on what I wrote. So I'm someone that, when you look at the slides, they're not packed out, and that's because I'm, I'm going to scribble notes all over the place. That's also why I record these, and then I'll post them onto Canvas so that you can see them. I don't know if I'm going to record you and the class after you and pick whichever is the better of the two. Maybe I'll record yours, and if I don't like how I did, then I'll record them. I don't know. I have awful penmanship when I write this way. I just thought I should warn you now. It is much nicer when I write like up on a whiteboard, and that's because I learned how to write on a whiteboard like 20 years after I learned how to write on paper. Touching that won't help. Also, for each lecture, I'm going to have some type of learning objective. What I'm telling you by this is this is what I'm going to test you on when the tests show up. So I give you a laundry list of everything that I'll test you on. So if you're curious, so is it from the book? Well, it, it's this list. So if it's on this list, or if you look in the book and you see something and it's not in one of these lists, the answer is no, you don't care. And we move on. I use book questions, but I only pick them based upon what I tell you. So I don't do that, hey, everything's fair game. No, I, I don't like that idea. So I suppose, uh, first thing, my name's Eric Rothball. I do not have a doctorate. I have two master's degrees. I have one in science education, one in biology. I've taught high school for 14 years. It's my second year teaching at the college level. I teach here at Cyprus. This is my fourth semester teaching here. I've taught um, 241, which is just regular physiology, and then this one. I've taught it for the last three semesters. I also teach at Long Beach State. Over there, I teach their equivalent of 174, at least the genetics half of it. I also teach the big genetics lecture. So I have that Monday, Wednesday nights. I have 240 students in that class. So that one right there. I also teach at Saddleback in the mornings here. And that's like a bio 101 for them. And then I teach a lab at Santa Ana. So if it ever feels like I am discombobulated and I don't know what's going on, that is probably because it is true. As you can see, Tuesdays and Thursdays are fun. I am mildly bitter that you all have class tonight. I'd say let's cancel it, but the problem is like it's going to haunt us if we don't. And the main reason why is because I'm a 10-year-old, I think mentally. And there's a show on Disney Plus that I love, and it's the final episode tonight at 6 o'clock, and I'm like, I kind of want to say, like, okay, screw class, let's watch it. But it's like, so you three were giggling, so you know what the show is. Oh, okay, then never mind. Do any of you know what the show is? It's Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock? Yes, it's Percy Jackson. I did think 
Yeah, Percy Jackson. Yeah. And yes, I've read all the books and the follow-up uh, pentology and the follow-up pentology. Yeah, I, I'm that person. Anyways, for student hours, oh, I thought I fixed this. I didn't. Shame on me. They actually, I actually was going to have them during this class time, but then they added the section. So what they're going to be is Tuesday and Thursday from 1.30 to 2. So it'll be right beforehand. For you all, that's no big whoop-de-doo. It's for the other section where it's like, okay, they got to try. Uh, I've done stuff. I've taught a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, that's fun. So yeah, I know it's annoying, but here they like to have the lectures in the lab spaces, which means technically we need to treat this like it's a lab every single day, which is why it's keep the food and the drink away. Just so that you are aware, not to make you paranoid, though to make you paranoid, where you all like to keep everything, this is where we're going to store the pigs. So whenever we have any type of preserved specimen, they're actually piled about where all of your drink is. Just thought you'd like to know. I typically will leave my water here. Um, you will also notice that sometimes people in other classes are going to bring food in. You will notice that they did, not because you will see the food, but you will see the trail of ants. This room, for whatever reason, gets the ants and we get them bad. So if you bring food in, it will get found. And usually the ants are within like 30 minutes. They are particularly good. I wish that weren't true, but it is. Okay, so we have to do safety rules. Hooray. Uh, don't have an accident. Okay. Wear closed-toed shoes. We're not going to play with fire, and the only time we ever really deal with chemicals is when we're dealing with dissections. And at the end, we're going to do some chemical tests. For those days, just watch your hair and your clothing, because if it dips on in, it might not wash out, and that kind of sucks. You're not going to do this. I told you about that. For the most part, we'll be okay in here, especially because it's a small class. So that should be nice. I'll let you know whenever we have a safety issue to worry about. You don't need to worry about reading MSDS sheets, material safety data sheets. If there's a hazard, I will warn you about it. Obviously, don't just start randomly putting stuff into your mouth because that is weird. Read the labels, put stuff back to where you found it. We will have some things that are hazardous and they're going to be kept in the fume hood. So if you see the fume hood with the light on and I reference the fume hood, obviously something needs to go into there. That's just because we're going to be dealing with some stuff later on. And Robin just left stuff in there. Uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. You obviously don't need to buy your own. We have gloves. Obviously, when we're dealing with dissections, you're going to want to wear gloves. When we get to dissection season, you might want to wear goggles just because the fumes are irritants to your eye. This then becomes your call if you wish to use these ones, or if you have your own from chemistry, you can wear those. doesn't matter to me. I would not necessarily recommend wearing a face mask when we do the dissections, and the reason why is you're wearing the face mask to avoid the smell, and the way nervous systems work is you only keep information being processed if it's important to you. So if you keep hiding something from your brain, it's always, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? And you're going to notice the smell for three hours in a row. Whereas if you just sat there and just let the attack happen, after five minutes, you forget the smell is there. Until you walk out of the room and you come back in, that's like a reset button and you just start all over. <clears throat> that said, if you also know you're, it's not really a safety rule, but if you know you're going to be sick or you are sick, Either don't show up, tell your group, because the group might rely on you, or just put a mask on. So if, when I know I'm sick, I'm just going to be masked. Doesn't mean I have COVID, just means I'm sick, and I would like to not get you sick. Uh, 
or glassware where it'll wash stuff out. These sinks seem to be pretty nice. This one here kind of sucks. I wouldn't use that one. This one here is okay, but for the most part, we seem to like to use those two. If you have glassware, especially for your independent experiment, you're going to want to just clean up after yourself to be nice. If you do break stuff, please let me know. I will clean it up. Broken glass goes here. It never goes into the trash can. Obviously, when we use balances, you don't just put chemicals onto it. You always have some type of weigh boat or some other device, and then you put chemicals onto it. For the microscopes, we'll talk about what to do with those. We're going to use them quite a bit. Basically, it's putting them back in a safe condition so they don't break. It's not really a safety rule. It's a let's not charge you a lot of money because you broke it rule, which I guess is safety because it's quite ridiculous how much those things cost. If there's noise or something like that, be nice of others. There's 12 of us. We'll be okay. Uh, look ahead of time. You'll find that won't be too bad. We are the only lab in here, meaning 276. So it's either going to be you or it's going to be the lecture right after you who's to blame. So it's a small group of people who's responsible for if something goes wrong. For the dissections, we only dissect in trays. That's because they juice and... Yeah, that's fun. We'll be respectful of the dissection specimen. We'll only dissect when we need to, which will be make it'll make sense because you're not going to be able to get a hold of them otherwise. We actually can't dump the preservative down the drain. We'll actually keep it in the waste. The catch also will be we're actually going to do our big dissection, which is pigs, over the course of two weeks. And if you get rid of all of the preservative, they dry out, and then they really smell. They really smell. So you don't actually want to get rid of all of the preservative. You want to keep a little bit behind. When we do dissect, you can't put di the dissected specimens into the trash. I'll tell you what to do if you have chunks or stuff like that, but it has to go into biohazard, which is this big, big red button in the back. Told you about gloves, lab coats. That depends on your paranoia. If you don't care if you get juiced on your clothing, then eh, you don't eat them. Lab coats are expensive. I don't know in, are any of you in Ochem right now? Are, have they asked you to get lab coats or no? See, of all the labs, Ochem is the one where it's like, yeah, I'd be wearing a lab coat in Ochem. You get some of that stuff on you, it dissolves right through your skin. Like, no, no, I'll cover up, thank you. Obviously, keep things away from your face because that's bad. Um, it just dawned on me I didn't do the one thing that I really should. Eye protection and all that stuff. If you do get chemicals in your eyes, you will need to use the eye wash. Eye wash is right over here. You come, you grab, you pull it down. It will immediately start dispensing. You have to keep your eyes open for 15 minutes. If any of you happen to wear contact lenses, you need to have your contact lenses out of your eyes to use it. Otherwise, you just wash your contact lens, and that's kind of stupid. We will call 911. They'll determine whether or not you're going to the hospital or not based upon what's not in your eye. Depending, We don't really use super powerful bases in here, which is kind of nice. If we did, you'd probably, you and you got that base in your eye, yeah, you're, you're going to go to the hospital. And they're probably going to suction your eyeball out and neutralize it and all that other fun stuff. If you get chemicals on your clothing, and we are going to deal with some starting in like four weeks, that if you get it on your clothing, it is going to burn your skin, and it's a powder, which makes it all the worse. If you were to get that, you are going to walk over here and use the other handle. This will dump about 100 gallons of water onto you. You will flood the building. We will all leave if you say, oh, it won't flood the building. There's a drain. Really? Then I challenge you to find me the drain. I found it. It's called the door. So you'll let everyone know. We get to call 911. We will all leave the room because you're probably going to need to strip to get the clothing off. Uh, so don't do any of those things. It's not on these rules, even though it should be. If we have a fire in the building, 
last semester, like three times the fire alarm went off. And it was always during lab. And it was always because some idiot guy, every time it was a guy, thought, I can vape and no one would catch me. And it was always in the bathrooms. And it set the damn thing off. And I was like, oh, you bastard. So if it, happen, if it goes off, we ask no questions. I'll say just grab your expensive thing, so phone and tablet, and we just walk outside and we wait down there until we're told, oh, yeah, someone was vaping. And then we're like, damn you. And then we walk back in. So all that said, you get to fill this out. So name, ID, signature, please. Further, you're going to pick your seats. Hey, look, you picked your seats. What I'm going to ask that you do is the way this is red is it's red so I can see it. Catches for you, it's going to be upside down. So see if you can figure out where you go correctly. For example, you are right there. Robin is the lab tech. She didn't know that she was going to have a second one of these labs to set up, so we need to keep her happy. She's pretty happy to begin with. I told you all that stuff. Uh, grades, for the most part, it's going to be exams, just for the sake of saying it. We do have a research project that's broken up into a whole bunch of parts that... It won't be too bad. I don't think it's too bad. You all might heavily, heavily, heavily disagree with me on this one. Um, it's going to be broken up into like, come up with a proposal, then come up with an outline for your paper, and then give me a rough draft of your paper. Now give me the actual paper. And then it culminates with the final. So if we were to look, the class is kind of three parts. We're going to have one part, which is going to be ecology. So that's everything up here. We're then going to switch into talking about plants. We're going to talk plant anatomy and plant physiology. And then we're going to spend the rest of the time doing animal anatomy and animal physiology. More on the physiology than on the anatomy. There are three exams, which are noted here. I decided to put them on Tuesday, namely because that way you have the weekend and you don't have to worry about the week trying to spoil you. The exams are going to be, the, for the most part, on the computer. There will be a short written response that you will do in class with me. I will tell you all of the potential free response questions ahead of time. But I usually give them to you a week out so you can start planning on how you wish to respond. What I would then do is I just have a whole bunch of pieces of paper. I fold them in half. They have a whole bunch of different questions on them. I shake them up and I say, pick your question. And you pluck it out. And ta-da, you now know what your free response question is. So I don't like assign it for everyone. Each of you will get your own. With like two of you will be the same or something like that. Our final in here is not a final per se. So on that Tuesday, we'll have our exam as per usual. That Thursday will be, you're going to present your paper. And that's it. And then we'll call it quits. We'll also have a lab exam. This, The way this is set up, this is for the other section, but you just move where it's located. The labs, for the most part, are going to be, well, they're actually kind of all over the place. We're actually going to do two labs today. We're going to do an entirety of one lab and start another. So we're going to start dealing with statistics and then look at populations. This lab here is going to go through there. So it's going to be several, several weeks of the exact same lab just because we have to gather that much data in order to do it. Next week, we're going to be wandering around on campus. So that'll be fun. We're also going to start another lab. That goes for several weeks. Technically, it should start this week too, but that's a lot to say hello with. So we kind of back off on that. Nice part is what we will then have, zoomed in too much, is these two weeks here, they are field trips. 
The catch is we need to figure out when we're going to do them because nighttime is going to be bad. Especially because there are two sections of this class and that automatically ruins everything. So we're going to need to figure out collectively when we wish to do it. You don't need to come to the same conclusion as the other section, although it'd be nicer if you did. So you know as to what these are, this, this lab number three, niche partitioning, this is going to be us going to Bolsa Chica. So if you sat there and said, oh, we did that one in 175. We already know. No, you don't. We're going to a different part of Bolsa Chica, and we're looking at something completely different than what you did over there. As in, the first time I taught this class, I didn't know about the 175 trip. So half the class went to the wrong spot, and we had to wait, which sucked. With this one, we also want to make sure that Timing is important with this one, and the main reason why timing is important is because we want to be there during high tide and not low tide. So on Thursday, we're going to figure out when we wish to go. So for you all, the question is, if you look at the date, it's going to be Friday to 16 or Saturday to 17. Which of those days is better? You don't chew now. It's think about it. We will vote. And if you all have a di totally different answer than the next section, then I'll just go twice. This other one of us dealing with diversity, this is going to be at a place called the James Dilly Greenbelt. And it's in Laguna Canyon. That one is a drive. And if um, this one, the hours are actually kind of restricted. So like it closes at five o'clock. So it makes it so sometimes we could go during class time, but odds are it, it wouldn't really work out that great. So it's like, okay. I had the, what I normally do with this one is we just flip flop when lecture and lab are. So we start off with lab and then we come here and then we finish up with lecture. The catch is, I don't know if you all end up picking, having a lecture that's right after this and then you come back for lab. But I know definitely that the class comes next. They might have classes right now. So it makes it so, okay, none of that works. So this will be either 223 or 224. There'll be two weekends of field trips. Obviously, if you have stuff going on, I can't dictate what goes on in your, in your life. So if you just can't make it because, oh, I work every Friday and I work every Saturday, then okay. You have to make up the lab somehow, which means you're going to have to get all the data from everyone else because it's still due for you. But, yeah. If you can't attend because prior commitment, I, I get it. We'll then have some two additional labs that we're going to start, and then we're going to do a whole bunch. These first four here are ecology. The populations, hormones, transpiration, and productivity are all plant physiology. Actually, technically, the productivity kind of, sort of, is ecology, but it's plant adjacent. So eh. We will then have a lab exam. Who's had lab exams before? Like, roam around, answer questions as to what you see. Lab exams. Oh, it's, they're sometimes called practicals. So, like, two of you. Okay, this will be an experience. This will be an experience. For the lab exam, all your labs are fair game, and I will let you use whatever you want. Just, you only get so much time to answer, so if it's taking you 30 minutes to find what you need, well, I gave you two minutes, so oops, moving on. So just be mindful of that. I'll let you use all of your stuff. That might not be to your benefit. After that, we're going to then deal with a whole bunch of animal physiology. 
We're going to deal with a whole bunch of slides and basic anatomy. We're then going to look at nervous tissue and we'll do a brain dissection. Uh, you're going to mess with each other with this one. It's actually a mildly amusing lab. We're then going to find out how strong you are with a muscle physiology lab. We'll then figure out how great your heart is with a heart dissection. If you've never seen a cow's heart before, it's impressive. It's pretty impressive. I had one student last semester who was deathly afraid of mice. So I need to let you know. We're going to do a lab that involves measuring metabolic rates. And we're going to do it using mice. We are not killing the mice. That's unethical to do. But we are going to be in a room with mice. As in like she became paralyzed at even the thought. So it's like okay, you're going to be outside while they're doing this stuff and you're going to then just crunch all the numbers for them. And she's like, I can do that. I just, I can't be in the room. So I get it. The last lab I broke up, I normally have this slightly rearranged differently, but uh, well, it is what it is. I broke up the last lab for the one last time into digestion and urinalysis. Usually they're together. By themselves, they're pretty simple. So that's when we're going to have the pig dissection. So that you are aware that way. It's also the freshest in your mind because the pig dissection is probably hard. It's the hardest to like keep track of what's going on. Then you have another lab exam and we'll say goodbye. Seems simple. Sure. Um, if you look online... If you were to go over to the modules, what you should see. So there's the syllabus. That's fun. Here are all the notes. I have the entire lab manual already available for you if you wanted to flip on through. These are the two labs that we're going to be doing today. I will always have the PDFs. One of the things that I'm going to need to find out from you, and we'll find out in a moment, is do you want me to print out the labs for you? Some people like having a printed lab. Some people have tablets or you have an iPad or whatever and you're just fine just scribbling down your answers onto there, taking photos, embedding it into the PDF that already exists, moving on. Some people hear that and say, nope, not today, Satan. So they want to have a piece of paper. I just need, I printed out all the labs for today. I just need to know from moving on, do you want me to print it out for you? So on your salmon colored piece of paper, it's a yes or a no. Yes, print. No, don't print. This is the case where yes means yes, no means no. No answer is I don't know how to interpret this, so I need to have a yes or a no. Please. Also for online, all of this stuff here that kind of looks insane, groups one through six, these are the research projects from last semester. They based their research off of last spring. So what you're going to be doing, and you're going to start working on it today, is figuring out, as a table, which of these would you like to use as the springboard? You don't need to do their lab. They've already done their lab. You just need to take what they did or what they found and say, hmm, I can do something with this and take the next step. Maybe they gave a, oh, it would have been great if we did the following. Then do the following. So you don't need to come up with anything super original. You just need to find what someone else did and say, I can do something with this and jump off of that. You're also going to find that I have this right here. It says something R proj, and you're probably I don't I don't know what that means. We're going to use it today. I also need to put up one other thing that we'll get to. Actually, I have two other things I need to put up. So here it says recordings and assignments. So like I said, I'm recording all of these. So I'll post the recordings here for you. I don't do weird passwords or anything like that. Also, whenever you need to turn in something, like your labs, they'll be turned in here. All labs are due midnight on Monday. And I, the way that I score them is I just flip through to see, did you complete it all? And I give you a five out of five. You could get 
everything wrong, 5 out of 5. So you sit there and say, oh, so I don't need to try. I say, oh, I get back at you because there's a lab exam that's going to ask you about it. So I'll get there. It's just I'm not going to at that moment in time. Especially because sometimes you're just super stressed with the lab and all that other kind of stuff. I know, all this talking is boring and awful. Uh, I told you all that. Yeah. I told you that. Locations. If you know what Laguna Canyon is, so it's this freeway called the 133. It takes you to Laguna Beach. That's where we're going to be. We're actually going to be at the intersection of the toll road and 133. It's actually this area. Actually, this is heading east. So here's the green belt. This way is taking you to Laguna Beach. We are going to hike up hills. We will find out how what cardio you have or don't have. My first semester teaching this class, I had a student, not to make fun of Ho, but I'm going to make fun of him. He sat right here. He never paid attention in the class. He got a D, he, but he did watch uh, soccer the entire time. And at least he didn't, you know, cheer out loud. So, you know, he had that going for him. He, I thought, was going to have a heart attack. Like, he, was, he went white-faced, so much sweat when we did the little hike here. And I was like, this isn't good. This isn't good. He didn't, but, you know, right. It's like maybe a half mile, maybe. Like total, it's like quarter out, quarter back. It's not bad, I promise you. He's the only one who had issues. Everyone else is like, oh, like I'm a little winded. That's because walking up a hill is not something most people do all the time. But yeah, it's not a bad hike. The only thing that we have to worry about, and this is a legit worry, although February we should be fine, is we need to worry about um, rattlesnakes. Because it's a nature preserve. And if it's hot out, you have to... I mean, all, have you never gone hiking with their like rattlesnakes out? They, they let you know that they're there, which is you know convenient. And you go, oh, you're right there. We're going to go this way now. And you just go around. Like, it's fine. And if, usually if you go in the morning, it's smarter because it's not hot out. And so they're like, eh, no. Like, they, they're not going to be out when it's cool. Uh, here we go. One of the things that is kind of difficult for this class, and it's difficult for me, not necessarily for you, is trying to integrate lab and lecture together. And the main reason why is this is a class that's really different than 174 and 175. Because 174, look, we did an SDS page. When do you come across that in your everyday life? You don't. 175, yes, look, let us examine a simulation of natural selection. I, that's not that's not a thing. Ecology is everywhere. We have to go outside to deal with ecology. And me talking about it isn't enough. We have to go to it. When we start talking about physiology, physio so ecology is a, like I said, it's a do science. Because it's a do science, we need to deal with Field work, so we do have to go outside. The catch also becomes because it's hard to do experiments with it, we need an alternative tool set to just doing labs. That alternative tool set is called statistics. Who's taken a stats class? How much do you for recall? So if I were to ask you to distinguish between a one-factor ANOVA and a two-factor ANOVA, could you? Where the p-value comes from? Degrees of freedom. Null and alternative hypotheses. 
When to t-test, when to ANOVA. Correlation versus a regression. Exactly. So here's our problem. Ecology requires you to know statistics. But you all don't have a stats background. And even if you have a stats background, it's like, oh, I don't know. I sat there and I said, I don't know what the hell's going on the entire time. They kept talking about stuff and then they'd write stuff and you're like, I think that's math, but I'm not quite sure that's math. Yeah, it's like, it's like, oh, if you use this test, it means this. But if you use this test, it means this. And you're like, what's the answer? Tell me what the answer is. It's like, what well, depends on which test you use. And you're like, I hate this. I hate this. Yeah, we have to do statistics. Because it's how we make sense of ecology. Ecology is also really good for long-term projects. So that's why we're going to use it for long-term projects, or at least go adjacent to it. Physiology is complicated. It's really good for experiments. The catch is physiology is always dependent upon the environment. So we need to know what's going on with ecology to make sense of what's going to go on with physiology, which is why this class exists. It integrates the two. It also has chemistry. We have to do chemistry. We're not doing OCHEM chemistry. We're not even really going to do, like, general chemistry. But we do need, like, mix stuff and see what happens. We do have to say sodium ions and we have to know ion versus a molecule. Like we have that stuff going on for us. Ecology, I don't know. Sunshine. But physiology, like chemistry, shows up. We, for the most part, try and make everything match up, which is nice. Okay. So stats. What are we doing with all of this jazz? What we need to worry about is how we perform things in lab. And controlled experiments turn out to be really, really, really hard to do. And that's because there's always more variables that exist than we have any ability to comprehend. Or we had no clue that we needed to worry about them. So a controlled experiment, I know everything that's going to happen. I'm using. E. coli that are all genetically identical to each other because I can grow them up in a flask ahead of time so I know that they're all clones of the same part. We're using the exact same reagents every single time. And the result of that is I do this transformation and they should all turn out to have glowing green proteins or whatever you would do. Those are nice and simple and they're controlled. I can't go outside and say, oh, let me do the same thing. Or if I wish to study you, I can't do the same thing. So the way that we need to deal with all the things that aren't identical, the way that we consider the randomness and the variability, is we need to apply statistics. Can't remember, do I throw it in now? I do. It turns out when we look at sets of numbers, and I can't tell you why this is the case, because I'm not enough of a statistician to be able to tell you, but certain sets of numbers fall into certain types of patterns. Those patterns we call distributions. They look like that. Each of these colored lines is a different type of distribution. And what we have to do in the game of statistics is, depending on whatever we're dealing with, and for every question we could possibly imagine, they come with a distribution. What we need to do is ask the question, this is the ideal sample. I now have my set of data, and I want to know, does it match the pattern I'm expecting. Do my data match the distribution that should exist? And what statistics will allow us to do is say, 
Maybe or maybe not. But that's all we get is a maybe or a maybe not. We do not get yes or no. We get maybes or maybe nots, which is a key thing to note. Do you turn out to match? It's a maybe or it's a maybe not. Which is deeply unsatisfying. It's you're in math, you're in calculus, and you're asked to prove something stupid that you don't care about. But you go through and you finally figure out the proof and you have it written down. The professor looks at it and says, yes, that's the proof. And you're like, yes, I did it. Here, or you're in OCHEM and you have to do a synthesis. You finally figure out what reagents to put in what order to turn the compound A into compound B. You figure it out. The professor says, yes, you did. And you're like, yes. Here, you're going to do your experiment. You're going to gather your data. You're going to do your statistical analysis. And the answer is going to be, I'm going to ask you, so did it work or not? And you're going to say, maybe. Well, damn it. That's not, I, I want the yes moment. And you are never going to get it with statistics. Statistics do not give you, yes. They gave you, maybe. It's just, how sure are you of your maybe? The catch with statistics is it has something to do with your calculations. So if I were to change your calculations... which is a nice way of saying change your experiment, you change what you expect. Which kind of sucks. <coughs> which means we need to build up a toolkit of potential questions we could ask and what statistics we can use with it. From the four of you who did, who took stats, did you love the formulas? You had a professor who made you memorize them, which was, I hated you before and I hate you even more now. There's no point. I, I'm not, you know, what, why, why would you memorize it? We're going to use cheaters to do the, all the calculations. Why? Because it's more important to interpret correctly than, did you use the correct formula? I don't have time for this. Say, that's for a stats class. Everyone else, we're just, show me how to use it. And that's what we're going to do. So when we do all this, I'm not going to expect that you are capable of doing all the calculations yourself. I am going to show you two different ways to figure out the numbers, and we'll work on you know how do you interpret all this jazz. Option number one will be using Excel. Excel can only do so much. And for those of you who do not have Excel on your computer, you are going to find that if you use the online application, because you all have access to online Excel, it's not as good as like the desktop version. And if you only have an iPad, well, good luck to you. Like that, that's your call as to how you're going to make that one work. If you say, oh, I'll just use Google instead. I'm going to show you how it works in Excel. You're on your own to figure out how to make it work in Google Sheets. Sometimes the answer is you can't. So, yeah. Excel, if you know how to set it up, and I'll show you how to set it up, it will make it so it's really fast. Because it's just, oh, click, click, done. The catch is it doesn't necessarily give you what you want and it's always going to give you the same output and sometimes you're going to want a very specific answer and it just won't tell you just letting you know so we're going to have a different way of getting to it ultimately what we're going to use this excel to do is to figure out something called a p-value and you're going to get a break and then when you come back we're going to talk actually about what p-values kind of sort of really mean 
reason why we're doing this, so we gather data, we're going to do a whole bunch of funky math that we're not going to do. We're just going to say, do it, and we'll make the computer do it. And it's going to spit out what we call a p-value. That p-value is going to be something that we use as a comparison. So the big deal with p-values, and again, we're going to deal with this a lot more when you come back, is we're going to beg the question, of is a p-value bigger than 0.05 or is it less than 0.05? Obviously, you have the number in front of you, so you can just look and tell if it's bigger or less than. The reason why we're doing this is these two options are telling me, how should I feel about this? For reasons I don't think, I think I delay as to when I bring it up. Yeah, I'm going to delay. These two here give us different feelings as to what the outcome is. And what we need to get to is, what are our questions? Then what do we do with it? Then based upon what we do, we're going to know how we should feel about what that p-value means. For the sake of also pointing out, because sometimes it is entertaining, it's like 8 trillion greens. This 0.05 number can change. Just for craps and giggles. We used 0.05 because an old white guy said, let's use 0.05. He said that like 140 years ago. And we said, that's a good idea. I like that. And we've used it ever since. There's no reason to use 0.05. Some have argued it's actually too high. What this actually will end up telling you, for the sake of being simplistic, is it's it's how many times out of 100 you will be wrong. So 0 0.05 means five times out of 100 you will get the wrong answer. Guaranteed, you cannot fix it. You cannot prevent it. That's how it is. Are you good with that? Being wrong five times out of 100? Means 95 times out of 100, you could be right. Doesn't sound that bad. Exactly. So now we're going to test out some cancer treatments. And we're going to see that the, and we end up getting a result that says these cancer treatments should treat your cancer. But we tested it at that level. Five times out of 100, it will not. Meaning out of 100 patients we give it to, 95 of them, it's going to work. Five of them, nope. Not going to work. You good with that? I mean, it's always a, oh, oh that was bad, like, exactly. I mean, it's fine, except that you realize that 5 out of 100, yeah, you're like legit, those are legit odds for them not to work for you. Those are absolutely legit odds. Then it becomes, oh, I don't know if I like that anymore. Usually, we make that 0.05 smaller. We usually never make it bigger. Could you make it bigger? Sure. You actually end up doing the exact same mental exercise of saying what it means. It's just you don't usually tell people that you did that. So you're kind of cheating the system and hoping no one calls you out on it. Why would you do that? Because it turns out this here allows you to say or drop a word. You can now say something is statistically fill in the blank. Or you could say significantly whatever. Technically, these words, statistically or significantly, require you to back it up 
with statistics. So if you say, oh, I got significant more sleep last night, what was your p-value? Which means technically you can't say significantly more, which is stupid, but yeah. This manifests in commercials because they will say clinically proven. If you ever watch or listen to commercials where they say clinically proven, what they're saying is they did this. They just didn't tell you what they're comparing it against. Anyway, the questions that you can ask. We have four different types of questions that we can ask that we will work with. You can actually ask a lot more than this, but these are the only four that we're going to deal with. And if you're coming up with a question and it's not one of these four, what I'm going to request of you is change your question to match one of these four. And the reason why is I'm only going to show you how to answer, using statistics, these four types of questions. So question type one, are two groups, A and B, similar or dissimilar? This only works, I don't know why I was going to write up there, I should write down here. What do I do with it? This is how you know you're getting old. When you have something and then you put it down, and you're like, no, 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 it's gone. Ha <laughs> ha, white on white. So, similar or dissimilar? What I mean by this is with some type of continuous measure. Meaning I'm not saying, oh, they have 10 people and over here has 12 people. Is that similar? That's not what we're asking about. By similar or dissimilar, we're talking about continuous measurements. Like, if we deal with age, if we go to fractions of an age, so it's not how many years are you, it's how many years, how many months, how many days, how many hours. And get your age down to that. So we have fractions of an age. You can now start asking questions of similarity, dissimilarity, or heights. Or something else that's continuous. I Meaning you can measure it and it falls onto a continuum. It's not whole group numbers. Second type of question that we can ask, ask is Did our outcome match an observed outcome? Or expected with an observed? So this requires percentages. And those percentages are usually predictive. Or you're asking a question if they're predictive. If you paid attention to the news right now, this is all the everything. Because there's stuff going on on Tuesdays now. Started two Tuesdays ago. It's not, it's not Percy Jackson. You all know what happened last Tuesday? There was a primary. You know what happened two week, two Tuesdays ago? It wasn't a primary. It was a caucus, which is like a primary. We have elections going on. And what do people start freaking out about? Is Gen Z coming out to vote? You know, according to the registration data, they compose such and such and such percent of the electorate. Well, according to exit, pew, or exit poll data, they made up such and such a percentage of those who actually showed up to poll. Why, is, why are they the same? Why aren't they different? If you look at the exact same percentages for the millennials, if you look at the exact same percentages for Gen X, and if you look at the exact same percentages for the boomers, if you look exactly the same you know, for alphas, are alphas able to vote yet? I don't think they are. Yeah, they're too young. Never mind. But like, they start like obsessing over crap like that, where it's percentages. That's what this is. This is a game of percent breakdowns. This is the percent I expect to see. Is that what we're getting? You did this one in 174 without knowing it. Did you not talk about general genetics? And like, oh, what are the odds of having a child with this trait? And you say, oh, it's one-fourth. That's what it is. This one is a genetics problem. These last two are going to be super similar, but they're not. Is there a pattern? As opposed 
to is there a causal relationship? So, is there a pattern? Is there a pattern between buying ice cream and being attacked by a shark? The answer is, yes, there is. There is a relationship. there, Or not a relationship, but there is a pattern. Is there a causal relationship? Meaning, if I buy more ice cream, will there be more shark attacks? That one there, the answer is no. You can have patterns without cause-effect relationships. Do you know the first one? Ice cream and shark attacks? When you buy ice cream? Well, that's where. When? When it's hot. When is it hot? During the summer. And where do you go when it's hot? Somewhere where there's water. Well, if you're not rich enough to have a pool, you go to the big free pool that we have called the ocean. Well, what turns out? Well, it depends on where you go. And you know how fancy you want it today. Uh, so then you go to the beach. What's in the water? People is the correct answer. There's people. And what do people do? Do they actually go out in the water or swim? No, they kind of stay near the shore and they shuffle around. They're like, ha ah, ha ha, I'm in the water. Ha ah, ha ha ha. But as they're moving around, do they pick up their feet when they walk in the water? No! We have stingrays off the coast. You don't do that. That's how you get Steve Irwin. You know who Steve Irwin is? The crocodile hunter? You know how he died? Stingray. Not because the stingray was dangerous. The hole got infected. Because they have barbs and it's going to shoot up into your foot. And when you have a big old gash in there, yeah, you're begging for something to get it infected. And that's what took him out. So that sucks. So you don't lift up your feet. Nowadays, they actually teach something called the stingray shuffle, which is you shuffle your feet. Why? Because they can feel you coming and go, oh, hell, no, 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 and they swim away. So they don't, because they don't want to get stepped on. They don't want to sting you. They'd rather not get hurt. So they move away. So what do you do? You kick up all the dust. Where do sharks, if they come near the shore, when do they come near the shore? When all the dirt is kicked up. Because it's less likely for them to get seen. So you are inviting them to come near you because it was hot and you wanted to buy ice cream. Ta-da. Is there a pattern? Yes. Is it causal? No. For the groups, I can tell you that this can be like a before and an after. So I can measure the same group before I do something to them, after I do something to them. I can compare you all with the Thursday lab. So we can do a comparison between two different groups. This also could apply for three groups, or four groups, or a hundred groups. We can all we have to do is do a comparison between sets, two or more. We can do that. These are the questions we're allowed to ask. And it turns out we have ways to test each of them. For that first question of similar or dissimilar, we can do what's called the t-test. Of note, and it's stupid that it's written like this, it's a lowercase t. It's a capital T. It's technically not the t-test. But it's lowercase t, t-test. It's also sometimes called the student's t-test. Why students? I don't know. I don't think the guy's name was student. I think it was made by Fisher. So whatever. So this is comparing two groups. Either it could be a before and an after, or it could be two totally separate groups of individuals. The ANOVA, the analysis of variance, is three or more groups. This word here. Chi. Say it's, we wait for our 
statistics, statisticians tell me. That's not the right font. So Kai. That's the one that deals with percentages. Correlation is the pattern. And the regression is causal. It turns out that these are the most rigorous of all the tests. In order for them to be applied, you actually need to test some assumptions, meaning your data have to follow certain patterns in order to really use these. And if they don't follow the patterns, then you just have alternative versions of these. We're not going to do any of that. We're just going to say, yeah, yeah, they work. Yeah, they work. Even though, no, they probably don't. But we're just going to run with it just because. Hooray. What we do in statistics is we test hypotheses. And hypotheses come in two flavors, which is what these make reference to. The hypotheses turn out to be what we call a null hypothesis or an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is named such because it's the easiest choice. You don't need to do anything with it. What do I mean by that? An example. If I do a t-test, I'm comparing two groups. My null hypothesis, actually, let's write it like this. My null hypothesis my alternative hypothesis. For my t-test, my null hypothesis being really sloppy is the two groups are the same. Why is that the easiest option? I have a treatment for cancer. So I give a placebo to one group, I give my treatment to the other group. They die with equal frequency, or they have symptoms at the same frequency. They don't have recovery, or they recover at the same frequency. My null hypothesis is it's the same. And what do you then do? You say, oh, okay, I guess I'm done. I mean, obviously, that's not your desired outcome, so you're probably going to tweak something. But there's no need to investigate further. The alternative is they're not the same. What this begs is which side is greater? What are the factors that influence this? I have more questions, more statistical questions I can ponder that start pointing at other statistical tests. The alternative means do more work. It automatically leads you to have to ask more questions. The null is a, I'm one and done. It's now my choice if I wish to continue. Where do these fall in? This first option. Actually, that's not right. Is the null hypothesis option. The second one is the alternative hypothesis option. How do we know which of these to land on? It depends on that p-value. That p-value tells us, do my data match the expected distribution, the expected pattern? That's a lot. So, that we also have three minutes left, so we should probably stop. So when we come back in an hour and a half, just so that you are aware, you're definitely going to want to eat food. Like, go out, eat something. Because otherwise, it's, it's going to be bad. What we're going to do is we're actually not going to finish what we want to do next. What we're going to start doing is we're going to, I'm actually going to skip some of this junk here about science. We're going to jump to how do we do statistics.
And what we're going to do is part of what we're going to do is lab, and part of it's going to be lecture. So the two are going to blend back and forth. We won't finish. We're going to finish actually on Thursday, but we're going to get started on data collection and how do we analyze all of this stuff. It's just so that you are mentally aware. There will be parts where it's say, I'm feeling really lost and confused, and the answer is, that's okay. If you are not lost and confused doing statistics, you are lying, claiming that you're not lost and confused. It confuses everyone. I have to stop and be like, yes, that's right, and then move on. Like, I have to pause because it's not normal thinking, just so you know. So if you're feeling confused, you are normal. You are normal. Just saying. So what I want to know on your salmon colored on the back side, Actually, technically, we're actually supposed to be done at 35, right? Not 25, because classes are 85 minutes long. I'm, I'm still going to call it quits. I'm not going to keep pushing. You can tell that you're like, we're kind of right here. We're kind of right here. And I need you to come back and be able to like let some of it drain out so that we can like start pushing back in. So I'm not going to push further. I'll just be like, OK, I'll see you when you all come back. But on the back side, I just want to know, what worries do you have? Because I'm pretty sure you've spoken to people who have been in here before. So you know whatever rumors you have heard. If you have nothing that worries you, you have no worries. And feel free to say, none. I'm fine with that. I'm not... Mm -hmm. We are going to be using a website, or at least I'm going to propose that you use this website called rstudio.cloud. You can make a free account. You don't need to use a student account. You can use anything. We could also use Excel. I'm going to highly suggest to you this one is better than this one. If you're planning on transferring to a four-year, Odds are the four year is going to teach you this. So if you just have a jump start on it, life is good. 